preparing for the great backyard bird count. Um, and I would like to thank our guest today, um, Dr. Charles Clarkson. Um, D Charles Clarkson was is from the from Central Virginia. Um, he has lived out his childhood playing in the woods and admiring nature. As an undergraduate, Charles involved himself in multiple avian field studies and quickly enrolled in the graduate program at Virginia Commonwealth University, where he studied the, co the cost of song production in male warblers. During his time at university, Charles also spearheaded a project documenting owl, owl dem demography in the state, and he built and maintained an ornithological museum collection. Following the completion of his master's degree, Charles was employed as a contractor for the Department of Defense at Camp Lejeune Marine Corps Base in North Carolina. He led a, a team of biological technicians tasked with rebuilding the population of endangered red cockaded woodpeckers. And he spent three years managing habitats and tracking woodpecker groups throughout the Southeast. Charles returned to school at the University of Virginia to pursue his doctorate in avian tech to toxicology, where his primary focus was on the impact of mercury on growth and development of nesting water birds. During his tenure at UVA, Charles began teaching for a semester at sea and led students around the world teaching ecology, ornithology, and conservation. Through semester at sea, Charles became involved in projects throughout the tropics educating and aiding small-scale coffee producers about using, using rainforests in a way that would promote bird habitats and reduce habitat destruction. In addition, Charles worked passionately to reduce the mortality of seabirds by, by the world's commercial fishing industry, by serving on advisory panels, attending Senate hearings, and teaching courses in ocean conservation. Following the completion of his PhD, Charles moved to Rhode Island in 2011 and began teaching at Salve Regina and Roger Williams Universities. In 2015, Charles was employed as the coordinator for the Rhode Island Bird Atlas, a five-year statewide project aimed at documenting the distribution and abundance of birds of Rhode Island. In addition to coordinating the project, Charles served as a board member for the Audubon Society of Rhode Island and the Aquidneck Land Trust, and as the co-chair of the Conservation Committee for the International Waterbird Society. Today, Charles serves as the director of avian research for the Audubon Society of Rhode Island. We are so excited to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us and doing this talk for us and getting us all ready and excited for the Great Backyard Bird Count. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation tonight to give you some background information on both the bird count and then a little bit more globally on, on what citizen science projects contribute to our understanding of bird populations and how we use that information from a conservation perspective. I will share my screen so I can start the PowerPoint. Uh, and my goal is really going to be to provide you with this kind of brief tutorial on not just the use of um, of your birding prowess to contribute data with the great backyard bird count but a more generalized synopsis of of like I said how these big data citizen science driven project jacks are really really useful uh, in this day and age in terms of our ability to gain as much information as possible on the year-round needs of, of birds in our region and across our, our country. Um, so as, as was, a, was, was said during my introduction, prior to my role with the Audubon Society of Rhode Island, I, I coordinated the Rhode Island Bird Atlas, which was a five-year project that was aimed at mapping the distribution and abundance of birds throughout the year in the state of Rhode Island. So we looked at all of the birds that would utilize the state as breeding habitat, uh, the birds that would overwinter within Rhode Island, and then those that would move through in migration, really trying to understand, first of all, what our baseline looks like. So what birds are where and what habitats they rely on, and then how things have changed over the course of the 40 year period uh, that separated our two bird atlases. So um, I'm gonna start with, hopefully, there we go, 
some grim news. I know that everyone, I'm sure, who has been keeping tabs on anything conservation news related is aware of the of the research that's come out of the National Audubon Society within the last few years that has documented that over half of all bird populations in North America are at the brink of extinction. And that is largely going to be driven by oh, the um, the extreme changes in climate that have simply been too fast for these birds to keep up with. And that is taking the form of, you know, phenotypical mismatch, which is birds that are uh, separated from their food resources by thousands of miles away. These birds migrate down to Central and South America. And then during the non-breeding season here, while they are down there, should we have a, a warmer than typical spring? The food resources these birds rely on, such as plants and insects, are ectotherms. So they don't regulate their own internal body temperature. And if it's abnormally warm in the spring here, then they become active earlier than they may typically become active. So by the time the birds arrive back on breeding grounds here in the Northeast, a lot of that food productivity has already come and gone. So that is what's defined as a phenotypic mismatch. And that is really putting a large number of species out of tune with nature. Um, in addition to that, we know that habitats are changing very rapidly. And as they do so, birds are moving. Uh, their ranges have slowly but steadily changed over the course of the last 50 to 60 years, and they continue to do so. This graphic just shows you the average distance moved north by birds. And so you can see that birds are steadily shifting their range northward. And so for us in New England, that, that means a lot from both land management and a conservation perspective, understanding how we can better manage our lands to support the birds that are here but are declining, as well as what we can do to make our habitats more um, enticing for those species that are new breeders to our states uh, and to the region as a whole. So in short, there is a large amount of information that we need uh, in order to better understand how we can best manage these avian populations and best manage our habitats to suit these avian populations. We need to collect as much data as possible. And so I consider that we are very much in this era of big data. Um, quite frankly, gone are the days where we really hyper-focus our research on the breeding season. You know, it used to be thought that for many birds, if we concentrate on doing things that will increase their overall reproductive success, then that will ultimately result in population growth. However, we've been learning more and more as we look at the effects of climate change on these bird populations that it is largely throughout the remainder of the year when they are migrating through other habitats or overwintering in areas that are still utilizing heavy loads of pesticides where large amounts of mortality are having impacts on these bird populations. So we are now really focused on understanding the full annual cycle of a bird not just what it is that we can do on the breeding grounds and what the reproductive success rates are uh, on these breeding grounds, but also what these birds require to migrate successfully, to overwinter successfully, and then how these things translate into their overall annual productivity. So we're really focused on understanding all aspects of bird species uh, and their natural history. And obviously, um, as an ornithologist, there simply aren't enough of us to go out and collect all of the data that we need. You know, if we, if we went out and we did so just ourselves, we would have very small sample sizes and therefore our ability to make predictions, to make spatially explicit models that depict maps that can be used by land managers and conservation agencies, all of that would really uh, falter in terms of our ability to do something from a positive conservation standpoint. And that's why we've largely turned to big data sources. So large scale citizen science projects whereby large numbers of volunteer birders, uh, both professional and novice alike, can contribute their observations. And those observations can be put to work by furthering our understanding of how birds move around the landscape and what resources they require uh, to survive from one year to the next. 
I'll just use the recently completed Rhode Island Bird Atlas as an example of how these big citizen science projects can inform so much of what we do. Uh, our first bird atlas was conducted from the years of 1982 to 1987, um, and it was with 69 volunteers that we were able to comb the entirety of the state of Rhode Island and get an idea of the distribution of birds that would breed in the state. Um, so the first bird atlas done 40 years ago was really just looking at the breeding season. Fast forward to our most recent second iteration of the Atlas. It was conducted from the years of 2015 to 2020 with modern advances in social media. We were able to reach out to far more people. And so we were able to procure 240 volunteers for our second round Atlas. And we deployed those volunteers to all corners of the small state of Rhode Island to collect data and to collect that data throughout the year. So we had people out doing bird surveys during the breeding season. We had surveys being conducted during periods of fall migration when large numbers of passerines were moving through the state en route to southerly overwintering destinations. And we collected data throughout the bitter cold winter where our woods were relatively quiet, uh, but our coastal environments were just jam packed full of these overwintering waterfowl that rely so heavily on the Southern New England coastline uh, for their non-breeding season. We were able to actually use the information gathered uh, during this bird atlas to create some very informative maps that are going to be very useful with our ability to update our wildlife action plan here in the state of Rhode Island, as well as contribute to a more efficient conservation ethic amongst all of our land trusts and other conservation organizations in the state. So just to give you an idea of some of the information generated from our second round atlas, from the breeding atlas, we were able to generate these spatially explicit maps that tell us a lot about individual species. So taking this American red start as an example, this is a warbler species that is doing quite well in Rhode Island and other areas of New England. On the left here, you can see this black, this map with black dots. This is a breeding occupancy map. And the size of that block dot corresponds to the breeding code uh, associated with that particular species in that block. The larger circles indicate uh, confirmed breeding. So these were blocks in which nests were located. So we have con confirmation that these birds were breeding there. The smallest uh, circles indicate that the birds were detected during the breeding season, but no nests were detected, so they were possibly breeding there. The bottom line is that looking at that map on the left, you can see that not only do American red starts occur throughout the majority of Rhode Island, but they actually breed successfully through much of the state as well. On the right hand side, this map shows the density hotspots for this particular species. And so uh, it's a stark difference between these two maps. You know, on the left, you can see that these birds were found everywhere. But on the right, you can see that the highest densities, the total numbers of individuals, tended to peak in the northwestern corner of the state, where we have large amounts of mature forest available for these species. Um, and so densities here can be as high as over uh, 108 individuals per square kilometer. So very, very dense populations of American red starts in this portion of the state. So again, while they might be found everywhere else, their overall numbers of individuals tended to peak over here in the Northwest. Um, this graph in the center shows you the overall breeding bird survey trend for this particular species on a regional basis from 1966 through 2018. And so this is Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island combined. And here you can see that American red starts over the give or take last 50 years have been expanding at a rate of about 1.3% per year every year during this window in which surveys were being conducted. So not all birds have been uh, increasing in the region. Some have been declining. And here's an example of that. This is the wood thrush. This is a species for which uh, there is international concern uh, with regards to conservation. This is a bird that migrates down to Central and South America, is a conservation um, 
is a conservation target throughout most of its range because it's declining and has been for quite some time. On the left, you can see that although wood thrush also are found throughout the state, they're not found breeding uh, in nearly as many blocks successfully as the American Red Start. Uh, on the right-hand side, again, this is a bird that is associated with more mature forest habitats. So you can see much higher densities in Western Rhode Island. Uh, but even here, to give you just a reference, we're talking about high densities of only 25 individuals per square kilometer versus over 100 individuals of the previous species, the American Red Start. And here is the regional BBS trend. So over the course of all of this, these years of data collection, wood thrush have been declining steadily at a rate of 2.6% per year from 1966 through 2018. So uh, this information is greatly uh, useful for conservation agencies in the state to understand where the hotspots are for both distribution and abundance of these species, particularly species like the wood thrush where management is necessary in order to help these failing populations. As I said, we studied year round uh, bird populations. And so some of the information coming out of our winter atlas, uh, we had people basically take their time and do complete surveys of each one of these blocks during the winter as well. And so just seeing how the data played out for these species on the left, you have the black cap chickadee, which is a very common uh, bird throughout the year here in Rhode Island. And although you see them uh, in every one of the blocks of the state, they tend to have their highest encounter rates, which is the total number of chickadees encountered for every one hour looking for birds. Uh, and that number tends to peak in the western parts of the state where you have more forested environments. And so during the winter out here in western Rhode Island, you can run into as many as 33 black cap chickadees per hour of birding. On the right hand side is the Carolina wren. This is a species that has been traditionally in the southeastern United States, but has over the last four decades been slowly making its way into uh, the northeastern area of the country. And so the bird is really uh, prone and susceptible to hard winters. And so you can see here that the bird is found throughout much of the state, but its densities do tend to peak. The encounter rate tends to peak around the south coast, uh, immediately adjacent to the bay and out on Block Island, where the winter weather is, is a little bit more moderated by the water itself. Uh, and so here, for example, on Block Island, you run into the highest encounter rates with this particular species. But again, you're only talking about five to six individuals per hour of searching for them. If any of you have ever participated in a Christmas bird count, this is a form of citizen science that has been going on for quite some time, since 1900 actually. And so this is just putting our data from the bird atlas into context with this long running citizen science project at the regional scale. Um, and so here looking at the black cap chickadee encounter rate from Christmas bird counts going back to 1938 in the state of Rhode Island, you can see the four count circles here, each one uh, indicated by a different trend line. And then here is the information that came from the bird atlas, this black dot with error bars. And so, while each one of these in, uh, CBC circles samples only a portion of the state, you can see that the average statewide encounter rate, so all acro averaging across the entire state of Rhode Island, uh, that encounter rate tends to be higher than three of the four uh, Christmas bird count circles and just slightly lower than that found on Block Island. So this is all to say, uh, that this information is incredibly useful from a conservation perspective and simply put would not be available to us if it is not for uh, very passionate volunteers such as yourselves who want to go out and contribute data. And very often um, you are going out and you are collecting information that seems as though it is relatively simplistic in nature. However, when you submit it, uh, that information coming in in bulk from hundreds, thousands, or even millions of people, depending upon the citizen science project we're discussing, is all going towards bettering our understanding of which populations are declining, uh, both locally and regionally, 
what we can do from a, uh, a conservation perspective to best manage the habitats these birds rely on during some portion of their lives, um, how we can develop monitoring schemes that can be put in place and be perpetuated through time, and then how we best uh, conserve these natural resources that we have on our, on our land. Some of the biggest and longest running citizen science projects are the Christmas bird count, which I already indicated. This is a project that's been solely collecting volunteer submitted data since 1900. This map here shows you all of the count circles. And so every one of these circles you see is being counted on an annual basis during winter, um, usually in the month of, uh, of December or very early January in some instances. Uh, and so you can see incredible coverage throughout the United States, but also going into Central America, uh, Northern South America, and even up into Canada. The breeding bird surveys, which are being used to collect data during the breeding season throughout North, much of North America is it depicted here. That is a survey that's been running since 1966. And every one of these red dots on this map shows you a location in which uh, volunteers are going out and visiting these points every single year during the height of breeding season and recording information that we are able to use to um, better understand the movement distribution and abundance of birds. And then bird atlases, such as the one that I just described here in Rhode Island, they have been in existence in one form or another since 1951. The earliest known bird atlas was done over in Great Britain, and then they kind of spread east, eventually making their way into the United States in the early 1970s, where actually Massachusetts underwent the first bird atlas, uh, which was completed in the United States of America. And now most uh, states in New England and many throughout the remainder of the country have actually undergone a first and some a second already iteration of their bird atlas. Shifting gears now and talking specifically about the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, they have really um, kind of seized this momentum, if you will, on citizen scientists understanding just how passionate people are and willing to go out and collect information at all times of the year and submit that information with the hopes that it can be used to better our conservation, to better our land ma management practices. Uh, and so Cornell has created a number of large scale citizen science projects that it runs throughout the year. Uh, the biggest of which is eBird. eBird is arguably the most heavily used bird observation tool on the planet. Um, any given day, millions of observations from around the world are coming in through eBird. Um, and that information is being used to uh, create these unbelievable spatially explicit maps that show how birds move around our planet. Um, they also do a project feeder watch, which is done during the wintering periods when a lot of people are feeding birds in their backyard and enjoying the cardinals and the juncos and the song sparrows and the white-throated sparrows and the tip mice and the chickadees and they are capturing that information as well as people report that information at their feeders and that information goes towards our understanding of how birds distribute themselves in these suburban uh, landscapes. Project Nest Watch looks at birds during the breeding season basically um, looking at birds that are breeding in your backyard and using that information to better understand the population dynamics of some of these more uh, common breeding birds across the country. Urban Bird Initiative, which looks at birds that are utilizing habitats in these urban and underserved communities. And then lastly, the topic of tonight is that great backyard bird count. Um, it is important for you to understand, as I stated earlier, that when you contribute your data to any of these projects, whether this is you going out and submitting your observations to eBird on a daily basis as you do your, your daily bird walk, or whether this is contributing to, to a project such as the Great Backyard Bird Count, it seems as though you might not be doing much because as I will go over in a few minutes when we talk about the, the particulars of the Great Backyard Bird Count, you're not asked to do very much in terms of your overall data collection. Um, however, that information, when it is multiplied by tens of thousands and millions of people around the world, can all be put to work to really 
greatly enhance our understanding of these bird populations. So for example, this uh, data visualization shows the population of a bird and how it moves across the, the eastern portion of the United States during the breeding season. So here you can see the bird moving during the breeding season of June and July into the eastern parts of the state and then throughout the fall and into the early parts of winter, uh, they retreat back into the southeast. So this is information that is all being garnered from eBird. So people go out, they go birding, they report exactly what they see and when they see it. And that simplistic form of information can be used to create these really stunning, uh, these visually stunning spatially explicit maps that depict whole scale migration patterns by a particular species. So again, don't ever think that the work you're doing is insignificant. Uh, as someone who runs and has run many citizen science projects in the past, I can tell you uh, that the work you do is instrumental in our understanding of bird populations. So please don't ever feel as though the work you do uh, doesn't amount to much. It is incredibly useful. So let's now kind of switch gears and talk specifically about the great backyard bird count. What is expected of you, how you can contribute, uh, and what to do if you're feeling as though you may be uh, more of a novice than you'd like to be. Can you still contribute data? The answer is yes, and I will, I will go over some of the particulars of how you can do that momentarily. So the great backyard bird count is basically occurring between February 18th and 21st. So this is a four day period in which you will be choosing a location to go watch birds. This is a project that's global in scope. So for you and I and everyone else in New England and most of North America that participates in the Great Backyard Bird Count, you're going to be documenting non-breeding season bird populations. However, there are people concurrently collecting data throughout the tropics, throughout the Southern Hemisphere, and they're all contributing data on the exact same four day window as you. And so they're gonna be documenting breeding behaviors of birds. So this is truly a global amount of information coming in on how birds are distributed during a single four day block of time across the entire planet. So it's really, really a neat project. Um, you have the ability to choose to watch birds wherever you want. So as even though the, the name of the project is the Great Backyard Bird Count, you can certainly go to your favorite birding location. If it's, a, if it's a nature preserve down the street, if it's a wildlife refuge all the way on the other side of the state, uh, or if you would like to just sit in your backyard and count birds or go for a stroll through your neighborhood, you can do that as well. The only stipulation is that you have to uh, you have to devote at least 15 minutes of your time to this project. It's a fairly small ask. So during this four day window, you can contribute as little as 15 minutes of your time to collecting information, or you can contribute as much time as you possibly can. Uh, so I would say that most of us probably have more than 15 minutes that we can devote to going out and collecting information on birds. And if you're going to go through all the motions of putting on gloves and hats and coats and boots and getting your optics to go out for a bird walk, you're probably going to want to spend more than just 15 minutes outside. During this period in which you are watching birds, you are going to submit information on all of the birds that you detect. So every single bird detected gets counted and that is seen and heard birds. So if you see a bird, you count it. If you hear a bird that you cannot lay eyes on, if you are successfully able to identify the species by vocalization, you count that bird as well. So if you go out in your neighborhood and you find two cardinals that you see and you hear an additional three in somebody's backyard, you can detect a, a total of five cardinals that you can report. Uh, to Cornell. Once you have collected all of your information, you've done your birding at, at one location uh, during this four day period, you can submit your observations and Cornell is allowing you to do that in one of three ways. Uh, data submission can be through their very popular and relatively new app called Merlin. Uh, and this is something that you can read up on at the website birdcount.org. 
Uh, you can use forward slash participate if you would like, or you can just go to birdcount.org itself and then follow the links that will take you to all of these sub pages. I'm actually gonna walk you through this in a few minutes. Merlin is a fairly new app, but it is very, very quickly gaining in popularity because of how easy it makes it for you to identify birds. Um, the app is free. You download it to your smartphone. You create a free account, and then you begin IDing birds that you see in the field. Once you do this, those birds are automatically uploaded to Cornell Lab. So as you have your phone out in the field, you're making avian identifications, you are actively submitting those uh, records and you no longer have to worry about getting home, sitting down on a computer and typing out anything. They're all being submitted via your smartphone. There are three ways in which the Cornell Merlin app are going to help you identify birds. The first of which is with field marks. If you see a bird, and the bird is relatively far away, far enough that you can't take a picture of it, and you're not hearing it vocalize, you can simply answer a few uh, basic questions about that species, about relative size, about the posture of the bird, and particularly things like the color of that bird. Those questions will then allow the app to narrow it down to a select group of species that are most likely based on your geographic location. You then go through those most likely species. When you find the one that looks just like the bird that you are observing, you say, that's it, that's my bird. And once you click on that, it's submitted for you. Um, a caveat to this, which once you go to birdcount.org and read through the instructions, is that once you get your Merlin app on your phone, you need to download what are called bird packs. And those bird packs are just packages of birds based on geographic location. So you'll go into Merlin and you'll say uh, either Massachusetts or New England, or you can even just download the bird pack for the entire North America, in which case every possible bird will be there so that Merlin knows which species to peruse as it tries to consider what you may have been able to, to see when you're out in the field. The second thing you can do with Merlin is if you are close enough to the bird, you can take a photo of it. Uh, on the left here, you can see a very unlikely scenario, in which case this beautiful black Bernian warbler, which is a warbler that spends most of its time very high in the canopy of a tree, moving around very energetically and nearly impossible to get a clear photo of, However, in this example, if you were able to capture a picture of the bird, uh, the Merlin app itself will identify that bird based on the photo. So while you might not be able to go out and collect photos of small energetic birds like chickadees or kinglets, you very well may be able to take a picture of a duck or a goose species uh, let's say there's a greater white fronted goose in a field full of Canada geese. If you can get a picture of that, Merlin will be able to successfully identify it for you. The third way that you can submit observations on Merlin is through vocalization. It's quite amazing uh, that the app now has the ability to identify a bird based on its song or even its call type. So if you are close enough to a bird to record its vocalization and it is actively vocalizing while you're out doing your survey, all you need to do is hit the record button when you open your Merlin app, hold your phone up, and it will automatically identify the species that it hears. So this is a really useful app to use to submit those observations. The second app that you could potentially use on your smartphone to submit your data for the Great Backyard Bird Count is eBird. Again, like I said, this is the largest bird reporting app on earth. It is also free to download on your smartphone. It is free to create an account. And once you have that account set up on your phone, you simply go out, you hit the button to start your checklist, and every bird you see while you're out and about, you enter it into eBird, and that will then uh, submit that information to eBird in the Cornell Lab, which will be going towards your great backyard bird count uh, data that you submit. I don't the have great to thing do about eBird is it will Sorry. also record your geographic track, okay. so you don't have to keep track of distance moved, time spent surveying birds. It will do all of that for you as a default function of the app itself. If 
you would rather not use your smartphone in the field or you don't have a smartphone or you don't want to go through the motions of learning how to use any of these apps, you can also use eBird on your desktop computer. So you can record your data the old fashioned way. You can go out with a notebook and a pencil and you can write down everything you see, making sure to also keep track of the amount of time that you spend outside and the distance that you spend outside looking for a bird. So let's say you walk for a mile or you can simply put that you're stationary. If you're sitting in a chair in your backyard for 20 minutes, that's fine as well. And that information you will jot down on a sheet of paper when you get back to your house you can pull up your computer, go to ebird.org. You will enter in your information to create an account, and then you can sit at your computer and type in all of the information, translating it from your notes over to the computer. So now uh, what I would like to do is actually end this presentation just long enough to show you uh, what this looks like. So this is birdcount.org. This is Cornell Lab this web page that is devoted specifically to the great backyard bird count. Um, I would highly suggest that anyone who's going to participate in this project goes to birdcount.org uh, and, and goes through the web page so that they understand everything. There's a short video you can watch, which really does a, jo a good job of explaining why it's important to collect data, which hopefully I've already impressed upon you. Um, there was a seminar today at 2 p.m. on using uh, the different technologies that I just explained to submit your, your data. Um, but it's pretty self-explanatory. Everything is here. If you click on the website, uh, uh, on the link to how to participate, it'll go through everything that talks about uh, basically the steps that I just informed you of, where you want to watch the birds, watch them for 15 minutes or more. Um, it walks you through basically how to collect the data and then how to submit the data. So if you want to learn more about the Merlin bird ID and how to use it, you can click on using Merlin bird ID. It'll take you through the process of how to get the app on your phone. Once you get the app on the phone, how to create a, an account. And then once you have an account, how to submit your data. Um, you can also go to the eBird link, which will talk about the exact same thing via eBird. So you'll have the ability to watch a video on how to submit observations on eBird. It will tell you how to procure the app for your phone if you intend to use a phone, or if you would rather do it on your desktop computer, how you can do that um, as well. So it goes through everything. The um, it's also important to understand how eBird works. So I'll go to eBird.org right now and show you that. Should you want to use the desktop version, uh, you just go to eBird.org. The link again is on that Cornell Great Backyard Bird Count website. Once you're here, you will sign in and create yourself an account. Um, and then you can submit all of your information that way. Should you want to create a checklist of birds for yourself so that you have a better idea of what species you're likely to encounter while you are out and about, that is also information that you can glean from the eBird website. You will simply go to explore. Uh, explore regions is here. And so you can put in anything you want. If you want to just do Massachusetts as a whole, you can submit Massachusetts. And here is the state of Massachusetts. There have been a total of 509 species observed in the state. One and a half million checklists have been submitted from 30.9 thousand eBirders. It's pretty amazing. Um, and this is replete with all of the information, the species, when they were detected, where they were detected. Some have photos associated with them, for example. So you can see pictures of, in this instance, a ruddy turnstone and where the species was detected and when. Um, so that information can be very useful for you if you are planning to bone up on your birds prior to the day out in the field. Uh, a couple more really cool things about this. And again, I don't want to overwhelm anyone with these technologies. Um, luckily, this is being recorded so you can watch it over again, but also the instructions on everything that I'm going over right now can also be found on birdcount.org. Uh, under the eBird link, they will have links for all of this and instructional videos that you can use. If, uh, if you wanna know more about any particular species, so let's say you wanna know more about the pileated woodpecker, you simply click on the species itself and it will bring you to the birds of the world main page where you can see photos of all different 
uh, individuals based on where they are, different sexes, different age groups of the bird. Uh, you can read about its range within the area where you will be uh, surveying. You can look at weekly bar charts, for example, to see how prevalent the species is during the period when you are going to be out surveying. Something else you can do from this checklist is narrow it down. Okay, so say uh, this is 509 total species of birds that have been observed in the state of Massachusetts. So that clearly in includes all of the breeding species as well. If you really just want a shortened list of the birds you are likely to encounter on your non-breeding season excursion into the field, you go up here and instead of selecting all years, you can select the current month and that will give you a total of 182 species. So 182 species were found in Massachusetts in the month of February, and it lists them all out. If you would like to then print out a list of those birds in a PDF format to take with you into the field, scroll down here on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see printable checklist. When you click on that, you get this really nifty PDF file that you can print out, taking up a standard eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper with a checklist of all potential birds you might encounter while you are out in the field. So this is a great tool to use if you plan to submit your observations on your desktop computer after you've been out in the field. You can take this out with you, use it as a checklist. You can put the total numbers of individuals in each one of these blanks uh, by the species. This also is going to be a useful uh, resource for those of you who consider yourself to be a more novice birder and you want to have this list at your disposal while you are out in the field so that you can narrow down the species you are seeing to better identify them. So going back into the, um, the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I should note one of the reasons why eBird has become so incredibly popular through time is because they have capitalized on the competitive nature of humans. And so through eBird, you can have a very competitive interaction with other birders in the state, in the region, your friends, because eBird will reward you with points for things like the total number of checklists you submit. So there is a checklist leaderboard. There's a leaderboard for the total numbers of species. There's a leaderboard for the total numbers of individuals of birds. And so it incentivizes a lot of birders because birding can be a very competitive habit um, to go out and collect information. They are also doing something similar for the Great Backyard Bird Count in that everyone who participates in the project is automatically entered into a raffle to win a pair of Zeiss Terra ED8542 binoculars, an exceptional pair of binoculars that will be a lifelong uh, birding companion for you. These are really good, well-built, durable binoculars that you'll have for years to come. And just by participating 15 minutes of your time for this project, you will be entered into a drawing for a pair of these binoculars. So now moving away from the specific bird count, the backyard bird count into more ID tips and techniques for those of you who feel maybe a little shaky on how to best identify the birds that you are likely to see in the field. Some tips that are going to help you when you see confusing birds. Uh, it's, it's important to pay attention to what we refer to as field marks. So if you see a bird and it's around for only a fleeting amount of time before it skirts off into the bushes and no longer gives you a look, while you have eyes on that bird, pay attention to things like the bill color of the bird, the leg color of the bird, the general shape and size of the bird. These things are usually, the, the shape and size are usually conserved within families. So for example, Piccadee, which is the family of woodpeckers, almost all woodpeckers have a very similar body form. So if you can narrow it down based on the general shape and size to a particular body form, that will enable you to better ID uh, the bird once you get your bird guide and crack it open. So for example, with these three sparrow species, sparrows are notoriously difficult birds to identify for a large, large number of beginning birders. On the left here, you see the song sparrow. Song sparrow, you can see has a bicolored bill. The upper mandible is darker than the lower mandible. In the center here, you have the white crowned sparrow with a yellow bill. 
course, the caveat is juveniles have an orangey colored bill. Uh, and then on the right hand side here is the white throated sparrow, which is identifiable by this very vibrant white throat bib and also this yellow headlight directly in front of the eye. And also note that the bird has a completely dark bill. So taking in these field marks and writing them down will make it much easier for you to identify the bird after the bird has left and you are no longer able to observe it. Uh, I highly recommend that anyone who is likely to uh, need identification assistance in the field, use a field guide for that. So you can, you can still purchase and bring with you a print field guide into the field. I still use print field guides when I go somewhere that has bird life that's new to me. I, I just prefer having a book with me as opposed to an app. Um, the three really popular books, and this is just three, there are far, far more than just these three, are the Sibley Guide to Birds, the National Geographic Field Guide to Birds of North America, and the Peterson Field Guide. These are all exceptional guides. You'll want them in your library anyway, so going out and purchasing them prior to your count is a good idea. And taking some time to become familiar with the books is also a good idea. Familiarize yourself with how to get to certain groups of birds very, very quickly. Know where the sparrows are in the book. Know where the woodpeckers are in the book. So that when you encounter a sparrow or a woodpecker in the field, you're able to get to those species accounts very quickly. Uh, as opposed to waiting until you go out to the field for the first time to crack the book open. If you are a smartphone user, you can also get many of these field guides on your phone as an app. So Sibley Guide to Birds is also available as an app on your phone. Another very popular one is iBird Pro. These apps cost just as much as the books actually. Um, so they are not free, but they are great resources to have on your phone because they have exceptional maps, uh, lots and lots of photographs of each individual bird species, vocalizations that you can listen to, which is one of the things that makes them slightly more preferred by some people over the print field guides, as you can listen to all of the birds on the app. You cannot do that with the books. So get yourself a guide, familiarize yourself with the guide before going out to the field. Once you do go out into the field and you encounter a bird, it is critically important to observe the bird as long as possible before you open up that field guide or pull out your phone to look at the app. Far too often, I'll take birding groups out in the field, they'll see something and within seconds, they're leafing through their field guide while the bird that they don't know is still sitting right out in front of them for them to observe. Unless it's a very patient bird that sits around for countless numbers of minutes, the bird largely is going to stick around for a couple of minutes and then leave. Take in that bird for the full time it's in front of you before it flies away. During that period, document the size of the bird relative to another bird species that you know very well, such as how big is the bird relative to an American robin, for example. The shape of the bird, like I said, it's conserved within many families. Most sparrows, for example, all share the same body shape, the same body pattern, the same foraging technique. So look at shape, look at size, look at color patterns, not just necessarily what colors are present, yellows, reds, and blues, but looking at this blue jay, for example, the color pattern, so darker on top, lighter on the bottom, with not much in terms of marking at all on the bottom of the bird. Uh, look at the facial pattern. Does the bird have a mustache, an eye stripe, a bib of a certain color, for example? And is the bird vocalizing? Is it singing? Is it calling? Uh, if it is calling, what does that call sound like? All of these things should be items that you're absorbing about this bird while it is in front of you, and then translating that into your search in your field guide once that bird has left. So spend time with the bird, not with the bird guide when you are in the field. Um, and lastly, just a quick little note on counting birds. Part of the great backyard bird count is not just what birds you find, but how many individuals. For most of these species, it's going to be easy. If you go for a walk and you see four or five cardinals or four or five blue jays, that's a relatively easy thing to keep track of. However, if you're birding along the coast and you see flocks of waterfowl, 
these big flotillas of waterfowl out on the water and you have to estimate how many individuals there are or if there are birds flying overhead in a big flock like Canada geese you have to do the same uh, your best guess is better than no guess just make sure you practice a little bit so get an idea of what 10 individuals look like and then extrapolate up to the group as a whole come up with a a method of counting birds that makes sense to you to estimate large numbers of individuals um, and get your best guess for those really large congregations when you encounter them. For most of you, this isn't going to be an issue unless you explicitly are going towards uh, water bodies to do these counts. So with that, uh, I am going to stop my screen share and take time to answer any questions you might have. Um, you know, I, I see we only have five minutes left or so, but I'm, I'm happy to answer questions as they come in. Um, hopefully that was relatively uh, informative and self-explanatory, but if there's anything additionally that you guys would like to know, feel free to ask now. So I see Beth has her hand up. Beth, if you want to unmute yourself uh, and ask away. Um, can you hear me, Charles? I certainly can. Okay. Um, counting birds at feeder, which many people will do this weekend, you submit the largest number you see at any one time. Isn't that correct? Because So to avoid that double counting? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, one of the hardest things to do, particularly in backyard scenarios where you have bird feeders, where birds will visit the bird feeder, uh, leave, and then 15 minutes later come back to the exact same bird feeder again, is in all of these studies, whether this is the great backyard bird count, whether this is a bird, a day of birding and submitting your observations to eBird or contributing to a bird atlas, you want to avoid double counting individual birds to the best of your ability. Uh, this will artificially inflate the total numbers of individuals if you double count them. So if you have an inkling that the birds you are witnessing may have actually been the individuals you counted earlier in the day, do not count them again. Uh, and you want to get your largest tally uh, that you can from any one visitation event, for example. So if you have 25 tit mice in your backyard, which I know is an over-exaggeration, that would be wonderful to have 25 tit mice in my yard. Uh, but if you did, uh, and then five minutes later, and then they disappear and five minutes later, you get seven more, uh, you should keep your estimate at about 25, unless you are 100% positive that those seven are all new individuals. Uh, the thing about birds, well, the thing about birds, there are lots of things about birds, but one of the things about birds and, and their visitation rates to bird feeders is that birds don't like to sit still for long. By doing so, they are targets to predators, right? There are sharp shinned hawks, cooper's hawks, red tailed hawks that are just waiting for these birds to become complacent and sit around in your backyard getting fat on sunflower seeds and not leaving. And that's when they swoop in to pick them off. So birds are wary. Birds do not want to be the next meal for a cooper's hawk. So they will visit a bird feeder uh, en masse while they are protected in these large aggregations. They will consume lots of seeds and then they will disappear. Where they go is to another bird feeder down the road. So they move along the neighborhood visiting all these bird feeders with regularity and eventually they will swing back to your house again. So that's why it's very common to see lots and lots of birds at your feeder one minute, then they're all gone. And then about 10 minutes later, you've got lots and lots of birds back at your feeder again. That's these birds moving around your neighborhood, visiting different feeders and trying not to stay in any one location for too long. Anything else? You can uh, uh, raise your hand if you know how to do it like Beth did, or you can simply just take yourself off of mute and ask away. Charlie, this is Mary Alice. Hi, Mary. How are you? I'm great. So good to see you and congratulations. Well. I can't see you right now because your video is off, but it's good to see you. I as know. Well. well, I'm eating dinner, so I don't want to. <laughs> That's okay. I can do that, I suppose. No, so... no, no, no. Don't worry. <laughs> well, well, now okay. I can see you. It's good to see you. How can I help? Good to see you. So, my question is I'm aware that. Um, Rhode Island has experienced some really devastating events in our forests. We've lost our oak trees in the Northwest. We have all these uh, really miserable things eating our 
trees and killing our trees. Um, are you all addressing that in your concerns for conservation of the birds in Rhode Island and what efforts are underway? Yeah, we absolutely are. So uh, along, so in my new role with the Audubon Society, you know, we're specifically looking at Audubon owned and managed parcels of which there, we have nearly 10,000 acres in the state of Rhode Island that we manage. So it's, it's, it's a lot of land. Um, uh, outside of that, you know, a lot of these big state management areas that are maintained by the DEM, uh, they are also suffering from high rates of mortality because of gypsy moth damage. Um, two good things to take note of here. One is we have a large amount of mature forests in Rhode Island right now. You know, hundreds of years ago, a couple hundred years ago, just like in Massachusetts, there was a ton of agriculture in our state, a lot less forest habitat, a lot more grassland habitat. But then as all of that agricultural activity kind of shifted towards the central U.S., the forests of New England began to regenerate. And so here in Rhode Island, we have a lot of forest habitat. And the hope is that there is enough sapling growth in the understory that, that these trees are going to replace themselves over time. Uh, this, the second good thing that might come out of this is that we have a growing population for certain species that are associated with old growth forests and require snags, require large dead trees for nesting. So things like the pileated and woodpecker, which has been uh, expanding throughout Western Rhode Island is likely to actually benefit from the damage that has occurred to our oak trees. Similarly, uh, the yellow-bellied sapsucker. This is a woodpecker that has historically been prevalent in Rhode Island as the wintering bird, but only three years ago, we documented the first two breeding pairs in the state. So now the yellow-bellied sapsucker is a, an established breeder in the States. And one thing that will likely make its job easier is having more snags available for nesting. And kind of the list goes on actually. Great crested flycatcher is another species likely to benefit. So there will be birds that benefit at, uh, from the, the tree mortality that we have had because of the gypsy moth damage. Uh, and undoubtedly there will also be some species that do less well as a result. The question is which of those species that suffer uh, are going to be um, species we can target with management. And we don't really have those answers yet because this tree mortality is a relatively recent event. And we're gonna have to go a few more breeding seasons before we really understand the impact of this on our local breeding bird population. Uh, but suffice it to say that we are monitoring it closely and we are planning all of the management activities we can in the event that we need to do something about it. So glad to have you here in the state of Rhode Island working on these issues, Charlie. I think you do a magnificent job. Thank you very much. I love what I do. And uh, obviously, <laughs> how, how cool is it to work with birds? I mean, come on. Most people, <laughs> most people bird watch out of a hobby. I get to do it as a job. I'm, I'm, I love what I do. Question? Anyway, yeah, Mary? Okay, uh, I just today, someone was discussing with me that the avian bird flu might be an issue recent, like currently in the past couple of weeks. Is that anything we should be concerned about with our feeders? Not, not yet. So we have monitoring stations in many of the locations where bird flu is likely to be transmitted from wild bird populations to domestic ones uh, throughout the Arctic uh, and we have recently within the last, I think three or four months documented avian flu very far north of us in the Arctic. Um, there is nothing yet down here in this neck of the woods and there is actually no reason to believe that it will make its way down here. So what we do know now is that avian flu has uh, been documented uh, in North America, however, nowhere remotely close to New England. So for the time being, it's not, not something that we need to worry about. There we go. Uh, thank you. I was concerned about the, filling the bird feeders and if we should yep, stop. Right. But we're good. At the moment, <laughs> you're, you're fine with that. Yeah, don't worry about that. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? I don't want to keep anybody too late.
I know this was only advertised until 7.30, but obviously I have no problem sitting here and talking about birds all night long. So I'm happy to continue answering questions if you have them, but if not, I'm also happy to, to end the session. So Charlie, I, I am using eBird. I'm sorry, am I? No, go ahead. Talking. Um, I, I just wanted to ask, I am using eBird, but this new Merlin capability sounds great. Is it a problem to use both? Yeah, the Merlin app is really useful. And, you know, I, I kind of moonlight as a bird guide. I lead trips to Panama, to uh, Iceland, to a large number of countries. And I also run domestic trips as well. I just did a trip out to uh, southeastern Arizona a few months ago, which was spectacular. And I'm telling you, more and more and more of my clients are using Merlin uh, because it's just it's getting to the point where I almost feel like my job is obsolete because they can find any bird anywhere and use that app to identify it with, with really frightening uh, accuracy. So it's really a great app, very intuitive. I would highly suggest you use it, particularly if you're not uh, an expert birder and you need that assistance with identification. Thank you. Doris, I see your wow. hand up. Yeah, I was just this, uh, asking the same thing, basically. I said this will be my first download of some kind of an app to actually record. I've been watching birds for a long time, but to actually record. So the Merlin might be the one I want to uh, download for the... You know, if you plan on doing more birding than if you plan on birding beyond the great backyard bird count and and having this app available to you, you might want to consider just putting both on your phone. Um, you can use either one of them to submit your observations, but they both have strengths. One of the things that I do love about eBird is your ability to go into the app and because it knows where you are based on your phone's geographic location, it tells you all of the birds that were seen locally by other eBirders within the last day. So if you're out in the field and you want to know what birds are local to you right now, you just open up your eBird app and it'll tell you. It'll tell you within the last 24 hours, these are the birds that were found right where you are. So that that is a great tool to have to help you identify the birds that you're going to be seeing while you're out and about. If you need that added um, assistance with identifying birds by being able to take their photo or record their vocalization, that's where the Merlin app would come in really handy. It doesn't cost anything to have both of these apps and they're both managed through Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So realistically, you could put them both on your phone and use whichever one you find to be more intuitive. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. I just wanted to share with you folks um, some ways that you can share the birds that you see this weekend um, with us at the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor and with the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Park, uh, National Historical Park, sorry. Um, so let me just share my screen. So we have a, um, a ha some hashtags if you wanna share your photos, if you sh share on social media, um, you can share to hashtag BRV birds. Um, Recreate responsibly, Blackstone National Park Service, um, find your park and uh, great backyard bird count. Um, and if you you do use any of these hashtags, we'll be able to find your photos. Um, and so we could kind of see all of the different birds that we're seeing together this weekend. Um, you can also email um, any of the photos that you have or any of the birding data that you find um, to us at birding at blackstoneheritagecorridor.org. Um, and it'll be a really great way for us to kind of gather everything we have together um, and see what we have right in the Blackstone Heritage Corridor. And then also if you're using eBird and you wanted to share with us, um, our username is birding the Blackstone and you can just share directly to us. Um, and we'll send you all of this information tomorrow as well. Um, and then also we have our birding ambassadors um, with the Blackstone Heritage Corridor. And uh, if you are interested in leading any bird walks or joining any bird walks, um, please reach out. And we are happy to talk to you about it. We're looking to plan some bird walks um, for this upcoming summer. Um, so keep an eye out on that and we will share more information as that comes. And I would just like to say, Thank you so much 
to uh, Dr. Charles Clarkson and to the Audubon Society of Rhode Island. Thanks to you all. I hope you, this was informative and I hope that you all are able to get out and collect even a little bit of bird data because all of it combined is uh, really important for the end goal here, which is the conservation of our feathered friends. So I appreciate this opportunity to come and, and go over the project. And I hope you guys all go forward and, and get some great birds this, this coming weekend.